Let's all stand now for the reading of the scripture. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 22. It's a very lengthy scripture, but it is packed full of stuff that we'll look at today. This is the reading of God's word. Peter says, finally, all of you have unity of mind, sympathy, brotherly love, a tender heart, and a humble mind. Do not repay evil for evil or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for to this you were called that you may obtain a blessing. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, let him speak his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy." always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison, because they formerly did not obey, when God's patience waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is eight persons, were brought safely through water." Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. That's the great news from the word of the Lord today. You may be seated. So if you haven't been with us thus far, Peter is writing this letter to Christians living in the Roman Empire. They were being maligned and persecuted, so he's trying to give them instructions on how to live in a land that makes them feel like aliens and sojourners. By the way, I think that's increasingly what's going to happen to Christians in the American culture. As it becomes increasingly darker, Christians are going to be called to be larger in their witness and brighter in their light. So Peter's words to Christians in Rome during his day are words for us today as well. So let's look into what he's trying to say. He begins by looking at how to live generally a blessed life. And we see that in his first verses in the text I just read to you. How do you live a blessed life? How do you receive prosperity and blessings from God. And he gives several ideas here that are generally true. Now we're going to see later on in this message how you can't ever promise that someone who follows Jesus is always going to have a life of prosperity and blessing. There are times the best of us who live faithfully go through really tough times. But generally there are some principles by which to live that will bring God's general blessing to his people. And Peter then walks through what those are. First of all, have unity in mind in verse 8. He talks about the need to have a unity of heart among Christians because the truth is you can do a whole lot more together than you can do apart, right? You know, Sunday night from 6 to 7.30, my wife Marilyn and David Brown and some others here are going to lead a prayer service to pray for the city of Charlotte and our world. Has our nation ever been more divided? We will not accomplish what God desires for a nation if we don't become 
one nation under God. Again, so there's going to be a prayer time together from 6 to 7.30 at the South Park campus for the purpose of praying in unity for the city of Charlotte, which is divided, for our nation, which has never been more divided. So there needs to be a unity of mind. And with Christians coming together, they need to unite themselves around Christ because the truth is, if you focus on Jesus, who is the hub of a wheel, the spokes being all of us, The closer we get to the hub, Jesus, the closer we get to one another. The farther away we get from the hub, from from Jesus, the farther away we get from one another. So let's come together in unity of mind around Christ because there's something powerful in unity. I hate using this next illustration. Mike Krzyzewski, the head coach at Duke, who's a good head coach. He really is. He's the one who said, if you try to fight somebody with just your thumb, you're going to lose. But you take each part of your hand, your thumb and the four fingers, and ball them together into a fist, you're stronger together. The truth is we're stronger together than we are just one part. So come together in unity of mind, and that generally brings the blessing of God. Peter continues, have sympathy, which means compassion in verse 8. Feel what other people feel. And when you do, generally that's what will come back to you. He also talks about having brotherly love. The insinuation is from a good family, when brothers and sisters in a good family really love each other with a mom and a dad who love each other, that genuine love is powerful. So in the family of God, the church, Peter says, have a brotherly or sisterly love. Treat one another like a good family member. And that love prospers your life and generally brings blessings to you. He continues and says, have tender hearts. Tender hearts, empathy, try to jump inside somebody else's skin and feel what they feel. And when you do, generally, that same kind of affection will be returned to you. He goes on to say, have a humble mind. There was a great theologian by the name of John Calvin who said, the greatest earmark of a follower of Jesus is humility. A humble mind. It's someone who's able to say those difficult words, I'm sorry, I was wrong. It's a person who has a teachable heart, who knows they don't know everything. And when you're generally humble, God brings back blessings to your life. And Peter says, don't let evil be returned for evil. He says that in verse 9. That's a great lesson because there is a law of retaliation that can work in our lives. When somebody hurts us, what do we want to do? We want to hurt back. And we generally want to hurt back a little bit more than the way we were hurt. And the problem is, thereafter comes a senseless cycle of retaliation. And ultimately, both lives get destroyed. So Peter says, don't retaliate evil with evil. Don't do that. And generally, life will go better for you. And he says, then following that up, but bless the person. And some of you say, I don't want to bless somebody who's hurt me. How do I bless somebody who's really hurt me? Here's a way you can do it. Pray they'll receive Jesus. Pray their hearts will be changed. Pray they'll come to new life in Christ. Pray they'll be filled with love and not hate. That's the greatest blessing any of us could pray for anyone. And we're supposed to do it even with our enemies, Jesus said. And when you bless even those who've hurt you, when you bless your enemies, you stop the senseless cycle of retaliation and you learn how to love, not hate. And generally, when you bless, you get blessings back. When you curse, you get curses back. So Peter gives us some very practical ways to be blessed by God. And then he quotes from Psalm 34, verses 4 through 10 in verses 10 through 12. Let me just read them to you. It's a restatement of how to be blessed by God. For whoever desires to love life and see good days, if you want to love life and see good days, want to be blessed by God, will let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from deceit. Only speak words of godliness and truth. Guard your words. Proverbs 18, 21, life and death is in the tongue. Some of you are still scarred today from negative words that pierced your soul from a parent or a significant other. Let your tongue speak truth and life, and generally, that's what will be returned to you. Let him turn away from evil and do good. Don't do evil, do good. Resist evil, do good. And when you do that, generally, 
Blessings will come to you. Seek peace and pursue it. This next Wednesday night, I've been invited by the Charlotte Observer to be on a panel at McGloin Theater with other people, some representing HRC, to talk about HB2 and how it's divided our state. And I've had some people write me when they've seen it being advertised, why are you doing that? You're going into the lion's den. And I respond, if not me, who? If not me, who? And I'm doing it for one major reason, to be a peacemaker for our Lord. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons and daughters of God. Here, if you generally want to be blessed by God, pursue peace. Pursue what is right. And then, for the eyes of the Lord then will be on the righteous and his ears will be open to their prayers. How many of you want your prayers to be heard by God? Well, then do right. Don't speak evil. Seek what's good. Seek what's just. And generally speaking, that opens the ears of God to your prayers. So that's what Peter's talking about. Blessing comes when we do these kind of things. But here's the truth. Sometimes life stinks, doesn't it? All who knows the truth of that, please raise your hands. Even for the most devoted follower of Jesus, sometimes life stinks. And the truth is, Jesus warned us that that would happen. That, that's why I struggle with some of you maybe who came to faith by someone who told you that if you just believe in Jesus, the rest of your life is peace and prosperity. Because it's just not true. Whenever you come to Jesus, you should have someone like me tell you, Come to Jesus, and he does want to give you blessings. He's a great blesser. Come to Jesus. He'll make your heart filled with peace. But you just need to know, Jesus said, for example, in John 16, in this world, you will have tribulations. Could he be more honest? You'll have tribulations. Why? You live in a broken world. You live in a broken body. You live with other broken people who will hurt you. You live in a broken environment that does not give us great health. You live with an enemy of your soul, Satan himself. And if you love Jesus, he despises you. And he wants to kill you. He wants to steal from you. He wants to destroy you. So you just need to know if you sign up to be on Jesus' team, that's what you're facing. So sometimes life stinks, and Peter knew that. And he's talking to a group of people here who are maligned and being persecuted for their faith. So here's what he tells them. If you still want the blessing of God, and who doesn't? We all do. How do you continue to seek the blessing of God when life stinks? And he gives you two ideas in these verses. First of all, he says, make sure you fear God first. He says, you will be blessed, but make sure you have no fear of them nor trouble. Well, who's the them? It's people who will malign you because you're a follower of Jesus. He said, have no fear of them. Now, remember, Peter followed Jesus for three and a half years, along with 11 others, and he heard Jesus speak certain truths, and you know he heard him teach Matthew 10, 28. Would you dare to read this verse with me right now? Peter heard Jesus when he said, and do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul, rather fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Tough teaching. But Peter heard him say that. And what does Jesus say? He says, don't fear people who may be able to persecute you and kill your body. But dear friends, you're not a body. You're not a body. It's amazing to me we put all of this effort and all of this time and expense and energy in caring for something that's going to die, that's going to get weaker, that's going to wrinkle that's going to ache, that's going to perish. And Jesus said, don't put your focus on pleasing people who will kill your body because that's not really who you are. You're a soul who's in a body, not a body that has a soul. So he said, make sure you try to put God first, who is the author of your eternal soul, who wants that primarily to be cared for and not humanity that can persecute you, but only God has the power to cast both body and soul into hell. In my humble opinion, I think 
Many of our problems in the world would be solved if every person on this planet would reclaim a healthy understanding of the fear of the Lord. So many people today live casually, not thinking, first of all, they're ever going to have to face their maker. Did you know in China, the government tries to keep the Chinese church from preaching the second coming of Jesus? They can preach other things about Jesus' love, even his forgiveness, but they can't preach on the second coming. Why? Because at that moment, people have to understand they're held accountable for how they've lived their lives. Don't don't fear humanity that can kill your body, but but fear the one whom you're going to have to face one day who has the power to send your eternal soul in separation from him. Fear him. And if you would dare do that, you can face tough times as a follower of God. And then Peter continues, in fearing God first, that then includes being zealous for God and zealous for good in verse 13. You know, my wife and I talk a lot about what we've seen in our almost 40 years of life together, um, in our many years of living on this planet. And one thing we've seen that causes us great heartburn, I wonder if it causes you great heartburn. It's America's increasing appetite for evil. See, some of you are young and you don't remember when some of the horrific stuff that's now shown easily on television, movies, on social media, wherever it might be, would never have been shown in America. There there were people trying to guard the hearts, especially of the young. But, But now... You need to know pornographers are aiming their industry at our eight-year-olds. And what's increased is a bloodthirstiness and a sexuality that causes our appetites to hunger yet for more that will only allow the producers to give us more, and then we consume that. We want more, but it gets evil and more evil and more evil. And Peter here says, if you have a healthy fear of God, you are zealous for good. You're zealous for good. Now, I I love the Panthers, and I'm going to cheer them on on Sunday for a victory. I love the Carolina Tar Heels. Some of you hate them. You'd root for ISIS above the Tar Heels. I get that. But I love the Tar Heels. They're my team, okay? I'm zealous for them. Peter says, have that same kind of zealousness you do for the Panthers or your favorite sports team toward good. Do you have that? Do you turn off Whatever it might be that might be infiltrating your mind with evil. Peter says, if you fear God and you really value your eternal soul, be zealous, he said, for good. And then also suffer for what is just in verse 14. I mean, you're going to get criticized if you follow Jesus. (laughs) I fully expect Wednesday night to have Some group of people absolutely hate me because I stand for biblical sexuality, for a biblical view of marriage. I mean, this is my authority, and I stand for it. And I have every expectation there will be some group of people out there who hate me because of what I believe. And I commit to respond with any evil with good, and I also commit to suffer if I have to for what's right. Let me, let me ask you a question. Have any of you ever suffered because you've done what's right? If so, that's the right thing to do as a follower of Jesus. Peter also says, have Christ first as holy in your life. Uh, Peter, in another place in 1 Peter chapter 1, says to Christians, be holy as I'm holy. And the truth is, dear friends, the church of Jesus Christ is supposed to be a place where a group of people who've been saved by Jesus, rescued out of darkness and now have come to his marvelous light, come together and we're different than the world. We're we're different than the culture. That that what the world believes isn't what we believe. We're sojourners and aliens walking through a dark land knowing heaven's our home and we look forward to that day. And Christ is the one who guides us and he's holy, so as he's holy, We desire to be holy. So amidst the darkness and the tough stuff that comes to us, we commit to follow Jesus and his life of holiness. Then in verse 15b, Peter says, And always be prepared to give a defense for the hope that is within you. 
That word defense in the, in the Greek is apologia. It's apology. You, you need to be ready to talk with people who don't believe in Jesus about what you believe and why. Be ready to give an apologetic for why you believe in him. And I'm just going to sit down for a couple of minutes and take you through what I've tried to do in 36 years of teaching you over the years. Most of you haven't been there that long. But I've tried to give you apologetics for your faith in Jesus. And let me just give you a few of them in case you've forgotten. Regarding salvation, when somebody asks you, well, why do you believe in Jesus? And here's your answer. Because salvation, the gift of going to heaven, is either do or done. It's not thousands of world's religions. It's either what you can do to earn salvation or what's been done for you to give you salvation. It's do or done. And I've chosen to believe it's been done for me by Jesus Christ because I know I can never do enough. That's an apologetic that makes sense to people who don't believe. Those are the two world's religions. There aren't thousands. There are two. Do or done. All the other world's religions talk about what you've got to do to earn God's favor. The only one that doesn't is the Christian faith which says it's been done for you through Jesus Christ. So that regards salvation. Well, then the question comes, what about Jesus? Why his uniqueness? You, David Chadwick, you're a narrow-minded, bigoted, obscurantist to believe that Jesus is the only way to God. Why do you believe that? Because Jesus said it. I didn't say it. He said it. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Jesus said it. Now, if you look at those words, there are three options. Either he was lying to us. He really wasn't the way, the truth, and the life. He was a crazy man a deluded dreamer, or thirdly, he's the truth. There aren't any other options. So the most important question anyone can ever ask him or herself is, who's Jesus? And the apologetic is, he said he's God, he's the only way that you can get to the Father, and he was either lying to us, he's a crazy man, or he's the truth. What do you do with Jesus? That, that's the apologia, that's the apologetic. What about the veracity of the resurrection? You know, it's the linchpin of the faith. Take away the resurrection and the Christian faith makes no sense. Well, how can you give an apologetic about the resurrection? Here it is. There were over 500 eyewitnesses to it. And many of those suffered a martyr's death because of it. And each one of them went to their deaths going, he's risen. Now, why would they do that? You don't die for what you know is a lie. People don't do that. It's not human nature. But they died saying he had been risen because they'd seen a risen Lord and they were willing to die for what they knew was truth. That's the apologetic of the resurrection. Miracles, how can you believe in miracles? I mean, we're rational people living in the 21st century. How can you believe in miracles? Let me give the answer, Genesis 1.1. Genesis 1.1. Just say to people, Genesis 1.1. What's that? They might not know. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If you believe that God created the heavens and the earth by a single word, which is what the Bible says, any miracle is not a problem for God. Nothing. The resurrection especially. If God did it, God oversees everything in the world and he can do whatever he wants to do. Therefore, the miraculous is very, very possible today. Or what about the proof of God? How do you prove God? Well, I'll give you two ways. The apologetic through the centuries. First of all, look at creation. Look at creation. You, the ebb and flow of the tides, the photosynthesis of the plants, the beauty of the clouds and the sun, the stars and the moon, how they all flow in a perfect orbit together. Think of all parts of creation, the design of creation. And then to say that that just happened, my dad used to say, that that's like saying an explosion in a printing press would create an unabridged dictionary. Look at creation. What, what do you do with how it all fits together? That, that's the apologetic about creation. Well, well, how do you believe in God? Here's the apologetic. Take life back to its first life form and ask this question to the skeptic, from where did that first life come? What's in fancy terms the prima causa, the first cause of creation? Where did it come from? And, and some will say, it goes back to that first Adam. Where did that first Adam come from? There has to be a mind behind that which caused creation. You can't create something from nothing. Folks, you can't create something from nothing. No scientist ever has, no scientist ever will. Spontaneous combustion is caused by a spontaneous combustor who creates this world. That's the apologetic for God. 
And then also, Peter says, but your best apologetic is your personal story. It's your personal story about the hope of Jesus that lives in your heart. How you once were walking in darkness and you now through Jesus are walking in new life and hope and blessing and prosperity. And you know what? There is no person in this world who can ever refute with their arguments what happened to your heart. So always be ready to give a defense of the hope that lives within you. And and then finally, one other thing, a biblical worldview. I mean, I'm going Wednesday night to represent Jesus, not Forest Hill Church, to represent Jesus. And what I'll represent is a biblical worldview. Because I look at life through the lenses of the Bible's worldview. You look at the world through some kind of worldview. Something's informed you how to look at life. And it may be secular humanism. It may be your profs in university levels. It may be something other than that. But you're looking at life through some worldview and interpreting it. I choose to look at life through a biblical worldview, which is, first of all, creation, Genesis 1 and 2, God created everything perfectly. Everything operated perfectly. Genesis 3, Adam and Eve rebelled, sin came into the world, everything's operating imperfectly. There's disharmony among people, disharmony in nature, there's disharmony in our hearts toward God, and disharmony toward one another. There's disharmony. And then God made a plan through Abraham and a nation called Israel, and that's the entire Old Testament. And they failed some, they succeeded some, but ultimately God brought into his son, Jesus, who died on the cross to forgive us of our sins, to restore us to himself and bring together a church that takes over what Israel failed to do, and that's to bring the message of God's love to the world. And then one day Jesus is going to come back, and he's going to restore Genesis 1 and 2. That's a biblical worldview. Creation, fall, redemption, Israel and the church, and restoration, the second coming of Jesus. Now, you might not agree with that, but it explains every problem in the world today. People ask me, why cancer? I go, Genesis 3. Why tornadoes? Genesis 3. Why Hurricane Matthew? Genesis 3. Why divorce? Genesis 3. Why my sexuality is so confused? Genesis 3. And I also preach the gospel of Jesus Christ, which can take anything and everything and make it whole again. I think it's a process. It's hard sometimes. But the power of God is greater than our sin. And if I can't believe that, folks, I have no hope to take on another day. That's the biblical worldview. And when you're talking to people, say, that's how I look at life. It's the apologetic that guides me. Well, what's yours? What's yours? And for many, it's increasing, especially among millennials. Despair and hopelessness. Despair and hopelessness. But we do have a hope in us who believe in Jesus, and we need to be ready to give an apologetic for that faith and hope that lives within us. And then Peter goes on to say, and when we talk to people about our faith in Jesus, always have gentleness and respect in the way we present it. Marilyn has a dear friend who said to her one day, said, you conservative Christians, you evangelicals, whatever you want to call me, I don't even know what I am anymore. You don't have a way of saying what you believe without antagonizing people. And we think there's some truth to that. So many Christians are just angry. Share your faith with gentleness and respect, verse 15c. Have a good conscience before you, verse 16. That means you know that when you're sharing your faith with another, There's no guilt of having misbehaved in any way in your life that hasn't been covered by the blood of Jesus. And then finally, secondly, as you live in this world, and and blessings are difficult because tough times have come to you and you're a follower of Jesus, Peter says, not only have a fear of the Lord, a healthy fear of the Lord, but secondly, remember what Christ has done for you. We we see that in, in verse 17, for he said, it's, it's better to suffer for doing good that it should be God's will than for doing evil. For Christ, verse 18, also suffered once for our sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Do you see what 1 Peter 3, 18 is? It's the gospel. 
It's the gospel of Jesus Christ that Jesus came and went to the cross and on his body, he took upon all of our sins upon himself and we died with him there on that cross only then to be raised to new life in the forgiveness of our sins. And then Peter points to one of the most difficult sections in the scripture. He talks about Noah and he basically says, just like in the days of Noah, when Noah preached to the unbelievers then, and they didn't listen to him. And these people who are in prison now, they're in hell because they rejected the message of Noah, Jesus speaking the gospel through Noah, calling the people to repentance and righteousness. They did not believe in him. They rejected him, and therefore a flood came upon them as God's wrath and judgment upon them. They are in prison. They are in hell separated. And just in a similar way, Peter was saying, the message of the gospel is going out, and you're going through a tough time, but remember that God will bring his judgment one day, and you will be like Noah and his eight family members who were on that ark, and God protected them and delivered them, so the cross of Jesus is your ark, is your ark of protection. And then Peter talks about baptism, and he talks about the importance of baptism. And he says it's not just to wash dirt off your body. He said the purpose of baptism is to give you a clear conscience. It's to get rid of your guilt. The major need of all people everywhere is to get rid of their guilt, their shame. People who just feel like they've hurt the heart of God and there's no hope whatsoever. And baptism, dear friends, is not necessary for salvation, but it's efficacious for salvation. You don't have to be totally immersed under the water. You should be. And I want to encourage all of you, if you've not gone to the class to learn about what baptism is and then be baptized, you need to. If you're a follower of Jesus, you need to be baptized. Some people ask me, well, I was baptized as a baby. I think you need to be baptized as an adult, saying, I believe in Jesus and I'm going into the water. Now, if you don't believe that with me, that's fine. It's not necessary for salvation. But baptism is the way you drive a stake in the ground and say to the world, I've decided to follow Jesus. When Marilyn and I have traveled all around the world and we've seen people give their lives for Christ, they tell us that the persecution doesn't start with the preaching of the word, even in prayer. It starts when they're baptized. You're driving a stake in the ground and saying, I have decided to follow Jesus. There's no turning back. And that baptism then gives to you a clear conscience free from guilt. And then Peter concludes this whole section of scripture after talking about baptism in verses 21 and 22. That Jesus, this great gift that God has given to all of us, has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers having been subjected to him. He talks about the resurrection has proved that the cross is true and our sins are forgiven. Then Jesus was then ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father. The right hand's the position of power in heaven. And that's where Jesus ascended to. And now he has all power and all authority over angels, over authorities, over the evil spirits of the world, and powers that have been subjected to him. In other words, he has all authority over anything and everything in all of the universe, seen and unseen. And here's what you need to realize today. As you trust in him, you have hope in your life. Why? Because the Jesus who lives inside of you and you live in him was resurrected the proof that he's God, the proof that we've overcome our sin in our lives. He's been ascended to heaven. He sits at the place of power and authority with the Father in heaven. And here's the cool thing. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6. Would you dare read this verse with me? Paul says, remember what Jesus did for you and raised up with him and seated what? Us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Folks, do you get that? As Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father in all power and authority, we're sitting there with him. We're sitting right next to him in heaven with all the authority in heaven and on earth given to not only him, but given to us. Do you get that? Now give God some praise, would you? That is the truth of the scripture. And here's the deal, dear friends. Here's the deal. If you really believe that, whatever you're going through, have hope. Why? Because You look to the one 
seated next to you in the heavens who controls everything, has all authority. And whatever you're going through, here's what you need to say. You got it. You got it. This problem, this persecution, this difficulty, you got it. And you practice what my dear wife Marilyn says all the time. You pray and you walk away. You got it. Because if you control all powers and authorities over heaven and on earth, you got this problem. You got it. So everybody on all the campuses, I want you right now to turn to your right. Take that problem that you have in your hands, that difficulty you've got as a follower of Jesus, and I want you to turn to your right and say, sky upward, eyes eyes upward, you got it. To God be the glory. Amen.